Good evening to all those in Europe. Good morning to America and welcome to all. On behalf of the Order of Malta, I would like to thank all speakers and participants for being with us today. A special thank to the organizers, beginning with Sister Miriam Baike, our moderator today, and Yves Reichenbach, webmaster, and to Felix von Lavik, my assistant. As you know, we all wage an uphill battle against human trafficking, a scourge on the rise everywhere in the world, especially during these pandemics. Europe is not immune and certainly could do more to prevent and combat human trafficking. We all could learn from the patient and often silent work of so many religious congregations to try to prevent human trafficking, to protect and rehabilitate victims and survivors. That's why we wanted to give a platform for some outstanding religious congregations active in Europe, often also in other parts of the world. That does not mean that we exclude others from future webinars. Tonight, Monsignor Vitilo, Secretary General of RCMC, will speak about the recent encyclica of Pope Francis Fratelli Tutti and human trafficking, and then I'll hand over the lead over the panel to our moderator, Sister Miriam Baike, and allow me to just briefly mention tonight's panelists, Sister Maria Luisa Puglisi, uh, working with victims of human trafficking in Spain, Sister Patricia Ebekbulem, in charge of the Bakita House in Lagos, Nigeria, Father Mark Odion, uh, also from Nigeria, now living in the UK, member of the UK Santa Marta group. In addition to tonight's webinar, uh, we have others in the planning for which you already can register on, you, on our website and save the dates of Tuesday, the 27th of October on advocacy and Tuesday, the 30th of April 2021, which would deal with root causes, especially demand. And in the wake of the 20th anniversary of the Palermo Protocol, we are planning to have a webinar on international prosecution of human trafficking, most probably in February or March. And my last word is that we should not forget the spiritual dimension of this combat. In that regard, keep in mind two dates, the 2nd of December, International Day for the Abolition of Slavery, and also in 2014, date when a joint declaration of religious leaders against modern slavery was signed in Rome by Pope Francis, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, by Orthodox, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, and Buddhist spiritual leaders. The second day to mark in our calendars is the 8th of February. It is the Feast of St. Bakita. It is also the International Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Trafficking in Persons. And now, really, I uh, would like uh, to thank Sister Miriam for her help and for accepting to moderate this webinar tonight. Miriam, you have the floor, you have the lead now, please. Um, thank you, uh, Michel. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, you are most welcome to this webinar on the occasion of the European Anti-Trafficking Day, which was the 80th of October, 18th of October. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be with you this evening to raise the very important issue of human trafficking. An estimated 40.3 million people were victims of modern slavery in 2016. In other words, on any given day in 2016, there were likely to be more than 40 million men, women and children who were being forced to work against their will under threat or who were living in a forced marriage that they had not agreed to. Today we start a series of webinars on human trafficking. Today we hear from religious who work specifically with survivors of human trafficking. But first of all, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this webinar will be recorded and will also be available later as video on demand. 
Secondly, I want to inform you that we will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You are welcome to write your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screens. We will then put your questions to the panelists. Religious helping trafficked women along the road to recovery is a topic for today's webinar. We will hear some introductory words from Monsignor Robert Vitilio, who is uh, working at the uh, Catholic Migration Office in Geneva. And for our panel of speakers, we have three experts. Sister Maria Luisa Puglisi, who is with us from Spain. Most welcome, Sister Maria Luisa. Sister Patricia Ebegulem, who is with us from Nigeria. Uh, we can't see her at the moment, but she is listening and she will join and is probably also there. So a warm welcome to Nigeria. And Father Mark Odion, who is with us from the United Kingdom. Also most welcome. Just a few words before giving the floor to our first speaker. The Sustainable Development Goals, in particular Target 8.7, calls for effective measures to end forced labor, modern slavery and human trafficking, as well as child labor in all its forms. This commitment to end modern slavery and human trafficking by the year 2030 will be an immense challenge. Appropriate policy choices will be critical. A number of international legal instruments provide guidance in this regard including the United Nations 1956 Convention on Slavery and Slavery-like Practices, the United Nations Protocol to Prevent, Suppress and Punish Trafficking in Persons from the year 2000, supplementing the UN Convention Against Transnational Crime and the ILO Forced Labor Convention Numbers 29 and 105, the worst forms of Child Labor Convention 19. 99, number 182, the protocol of the 2014 to the Forced Labor Convention of 1930 and the Forced Labor uh, Recommendation from 2014. These instruments send a clear message. Forced labor, slavery and human trafficking are ser serious crimes and need to be dealt with as such. But they also make clear that these abuses cannot be eliminated so criminal law enforcement alone. Rather, a broad-based approach is needed, which is strong emphasis on addressing root causes and prevention on the protection of victims. By discussing these issues and finding ways of action, this series of webinars on human trafficking wants to issue a vibrant call for global and personal awareness about the topic and for the need to abolish human trafficking, so concrete actions taken by all of us. Having said this, uh, I want to give the floor to Monsignor Robert uh, Vitilio, who is working on the migration and uh, has a lot to share with us. Thank you very much, Sister Miriam, and uh, congratulations to you and to Ambassador Vote uh, for your commitment and your dedication uh, to these serious issues. Uh, it's really an honor to be with you. Uh, I also want to pay special tribute to the women, uh, religious especially, who have responded to these uh, problems uh, with so much passion and with so much dedication. Um, I uh, am working with the International Catholic Migration Commission, which is actually a network of Catholic bishops conferences from around the world. Uh, but certainly many of the people working within uh, those national and especially the local structures are religious and they inspire me each and every day. So I thank you very much and, and, and want to uh, uh, share with you my, uh, my great and sincere appreciation. Um, I was asked to focus for this uh, webinar on uh, a, a summary uh, in, of the, uh, the Pope's latest encyclical, uh, Fratelli Tutti, uh, Brothers of All, uh, and, uh, and to uh, point out then some of the ways that this inspires us, continues to inspire us in our work uh, to prevent human trafficking and also to work with the survivors.
Um, the encyclical, uh, I'm sure, was long in preparation before we could even imagine the global public health, socioeconomic, and, uh, and personal crisis that we're facing uh, with COVID-19. Uh, but uh, its release on the 4th of October uh, certainly was especially welcome amidst this global crisis that's made more visible the terrible fractures and inequalities in our world. And I must say that those fractures and inequality very much influence uh, the situation of human trafficking uh, in the world today. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic also has spotlighted tendencies to close in on ourselves and to grasp that nationalistic and self-serving ideologies as solutions, even though they simply lead us to greater division and greater violence. Pope Francis raises his serious concern about the sense of belonging to a single human family is fading, and the dream of working together for justice and peace seems an outdated utopia. The Holy Father also decries today's cool, comfortable, and globalized indifference, and the temptation to go down the road of disenchantment and disappointment. He insists that isolation and withdrawal into one's own interests are never the way to restore hope and bring about renewal. And I certainly think that we could also understand that as a serious cause for our complete ignoring of many human trafficking situations that might go on before our very eyes. Uh, or to benefit from the, uh, the goods that we buy at lower prices because it's, they're being conducted by people who are trafficked or held in modern forms of slavery today. On the contrary, Pope Francis proposes the antidote of closeness, which he says is the culture of encounter. One of the most impressive features, at least in my view, of this new encyclical is Pope Francis's denunciation of the physical, ideological, emotional, and intellectual wars, walls and barriers that many of us set up to prevent meaningful encounters with others. Thus, Pope Francis recalls his namesake, St. Francis of Assisi, who broke down such walls in his day and could inspire us to do the same today. The Holy Father proposes to us the way of life for all Christians, that of unselfish and unlimited love, which is at the very heart of Jesus's gospel uh, of the redemption that Jesus offers us as members of the human family who are made in the image and likeness of God. I wanted to focus a bit on the special uh, concentration that uh, Pope Francis has given in this encyclical to the issues of migrants and refugees, and he calls them as part of society. And certainly uh, those people who are vulnerable to human trafficking and survivors of human trafficking are part of that uh, part of society. And we need to be sure that we include them very closely uh, within society. In his letter, Pope, the Pope offers authoritative teaching on migration uh, and on the gifts that migrants bring to the societies that welcome them. He takes serious issue with certain populist political regimes, as well as certain liberal economic approaches, which he says maintain that an influx of migrants is to be prevented at all costs. In response, he asserts that behind such statements, abstract and hard to support, Great numbers of lives are at stake. Many migrants have fled from war, persecution, and natural catastrophes. The Holy Father expresses deep regret that migrants are not seen as entitled, like others, to participate in the life of society, and it is forgotten that they possess the same intrinsic dignity as any person. By our decisions and the way we treat them, we can show that we consider them less worthy, less important, and less human. And certainly that is the phenomenon that we see with people who have been trafficked and are held in modern forms of slavery. Pope Francis asserts that for Christians, this way of thinking and acting is unacceptable since it sets certain political preferences above deep convictions of our faith the inalienable uh, dignity of each human person, regardless of origin, race, or religion, and the supreme law of fraternal love. 
these are the messages that the International Catholic Migration Commission and all of those with whom we partner, the bishops' conferences of the world, uh, and as well as the uh, religious who are engaged in this field so often, has we've been long proclaiming the by its our words in global advocacy circles, by our direct humanitarian service, and by our networking, uh, these these same words. These beliefs and practices constitute a fundamental pillar of our own identity as the International Catholic Migration Commission, but also I believe of all Catholic Church sponsored and inspired organizations and religious congregations that serve all people without any distinction and that respect the dignity of each and every human person. It also helps us to recognize the common values observed by all major religious traditions, as well as non-believers who are motivated by goodwill. Uh, my final point is around the Pope's call of the, about the need to transform the world. He calls on us to work together to transform the world by respecting the fundamental rights of all. He also upholds the common destination of goods over and above the desire to prioritize profit over people, a desire that's so prevalent in the economic strategies and financial speculation that dominate today's world. And that certainly, as I mentioned before, dominates our own purchasing uh, habits and behaviors that cause us to look for the, the best prices but never look into how those goods have been uh, produced and who produces them and the fact that many of them have been brought to these production centers uh, against their own will or by total deception. The Holy Father recognizes the key role that could be played by a reformed United Nations and many religious congregations and Catholic organizations are very much involved in advocacy with the United Nations. He envisions a UN that focuses on the family of nations, on the present day world stage in which the power of nation states has been diminished by the globalization of the economy and profit making that supersedes adequate governmental controls or intergovernmental policy setting and monitoring. And we certainly saw the effects of, of these situations through COVID-19 and the fact that, uh, first of all, almost the whole world was closed down and that most of the supply chains for every good that we had in the world was affected because of the way the economy has been set up these days. He calls for a just and decent work for all and for access by all to such labor opportunities. And he recognizes the transformative role that social movements can play as they strive to promote a social economy built on solidarity and equality. I, I'm going to stop there uh, because I know that we have some very, very important inputs from the other presenters and then good discussion that will proceed. But let me thank you again for the honor to be able to be with you during this webinar. Oh, Monsignor uh, Robert Vitilio, for these words. So it touched me very much that you started to uh, explain uh, how the Pope in his new cyclical speaks about closeness, because our uh, experience during this time of COVID is just uh, seems to be the opposite. So we see the necessity to, to stay as close as possible and to be very aware of this, and also to, to know that the survivors of trafficking are part of the society and have to be included into society as well as migrants uh, have to be in, uh, entitled and able to participate in the society. So there is so much of in inclusion and uh, being near to each other, but it's just in this time very important uh, to us. And uh, thank you very much for reminding us to this, but also to speak about what we could do, uh, as the Pope mentions, that we have to reflect how we are um, buying goods and what is the price and who might have been suffered to uh, that this cheap price is available to us to buy goods and to to live with solidarity and equality and also to to uh, supervise our own behavior so that uh, modern slavery is less likely because we are able to or willing to um, pay the right price for products 
So uh, thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, summary of the cyclica and this introduction to uh, this uh, topic that we are facing. Um, now, the uh, webinar is called Religious who are helping trafficked victims along the road of recovery. And um, now I want to give the floor to our first expert, Sister Maria Luisa uh, Puglisi. Uh, she is a sister of the congregation of Sisters Adoras Handmaids of the Blessed Sacrament and of Charity. She has realized a research project with the Ep Episcopal Conference of Migration in Spain and hold, holds a master in international migration from this university and has a degree in political science. She has worked many years as a community educator and accompaniment of women, mainly dealing with young women from Nigeria, helping their integration process and paper issues. From April 2001 to March 2003, she was working for the International Organization for Migration in Geneva. Today, she is the director, director of the Valencia Delegation of Amaranta and the director of a shelter for victims of trafficking in Spain. Uh, Sister Maria Luisa, uh, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. And I'm very happy to be with you tonight and uh, try to share with you all my experience, which is not nothing more than the daily experience uh, from more than 15 years now, uh, living with the women. Uh, I'm saying living and not saying working because uh, actually we live, I mean, as a congregation and mainly in the in Europe, we live with the women that we also we welcome in our shelter. So it's not only that's why I'm not saying about uh, not talking about a uh, work or a job, but I'm talking about living. Uh, I will uh, try to give uh, a short overview of what we do and not only what I do uh, as a congregation, uh, but uh, uh, I would like to start uh, saying that it is not a mission that we can run alone. Uh, we have to be as a network, we have to work together. That's why as a congregation, but as like even as a church, we belong to different networks at uh, regional, national and international level. Because as we already know, and we say in different uh, meetings and whatever, that is a work that has been done together. Uh, I will just put some slides which are like like some input of reflection although i would like to try to speak of what we are doing okay let's check if i able to do this here okay okay as Miriam says, I'm a sister of Adoras of Blessed Sacrament and Charity, so we can pass through this. And I would like to start with this sentence that is the sentence of our founder, which is the word is for me a tabernacle. So uh, I was always very touched when I listened the first time this uh, sentence, but uh, it more or less uh, it gives the idea of what uh, it is for us working with this woman. Because as a congregation, we start working with women in prostitution since the very beginning, and now we are since um, years working um, with women, women victims of trafficking of human beings with different purposes. So the what the protocol of Palermo says. Uh, myself, uh, I have been living in Italy for years and, uh, and then from, from six years, yes, I'm living in Spain. And to be honest, uh, I'll be, I, 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 I'm a witness of a changing of this trafficking of even of the um, target women. Uh, when I was in Italy, the majority were from Nigeria. That's why I'm so happy to have Patricia there to, to have her um, point of view of things. Then since I'm here in Spain, uh, not really so many Nigerians, but from different countries. Of course, they are from uh, Eastern Europe. We all know that, but it's not as much as before. But this is something that we are facing in this in our shelters, and we know uh, even how as uh, 
like sociological in and uh, political issues that we know about this. But I'm not. I will not be focusing on what is the um, profile of the victim, but I'm will focusing on what we do because for me it's very important in this time that we have to 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 be together that. Um, to give you an idea of what is for us to live and work with these women. Some keywords that uh, comes from our founders and then still are alive now after years. This is the first one, uh, welcome, care and recognition. Uh, as the Fratelli Tutti said in number 24, today is in the past, slavery is rooted in a notion of the human person that allows him or her to be treated as an object. And for us, uh, the word welcome, care and recognition is very important because welcome is a, fund a fundamental value, a feature that is perceived in the climate of the, our institution. It means that when the women come in our shelter, for us it's very important the disposition to receive her as, and to accompany her in her daily life. Which means that um, the women come and the women is in the center of our mission. I mean, uh, we work with her. It's of course, it's we need a uh, time to work with her. It means that not we can foresee the goal, but we need to work towards it. This is an important issue for the accompaniment daily on daily basis. I mean that um, we listen to her, we try to take care of her because we all know that when they arrive, they can arrive as in different ways and it's not the same that it's not the same as women arrive directly from the street. It's not the same that if a woman has already made some process in other in another institution, in another shelter, or uh, it's not the same if a woman has just arrived through a boat, I mean, this is important even to understand that we can have, a, I mean, we can have the idea of the process, but the process has to be adapted to each person. So, uh, our pedagogy, which is the pedagogy of love, uh, has three important words, which is welcome, care and recognition. But um, it's important to say, as we know in the Bible, where is your brother? Because uh, we should look at the women and see her as our sister. And if, if we recognize her as a sister, as a woman, as a human being, our work with her will be different. And one important thing for us is to um, the trust that we can build with the woman. Because of course we know that this woman has been uh, violated, uh, many people as, uh, I would say, um, they were not free to do or to decide for themselves. So now it's important that they re they recover and they will come back to their interior part of their sense. I mean, that it's important that they will be recognized as a woman and from them we can work to the liberation, because our Karim is a two part, adoration and liberation. So the liberation of the women means that she can recover, but she can look at herself, she can provide for herself, and definitely she can provide with meaning of her life, despite of what has happened. Uh, it's important for us to work with her, the, the truth of her life, but um, of course, with the trust during so, the time, the, the truth can even change. Can recover, at the very beginning, she can she look will, at herself. At the very beginning, uh, of course, she will give us a story. But at the end, maybe the story will be different. But this is not important because at each moment, it's important her truth. And then we build together the truth for her life and for her liberation. Because we all know that it's not easy for her to tell to herself what is happening. So this is a work that we get together. But this is important uh, to do with her through, according to us, the hospitality and the, and the unconditional love that if she is fine or if she's not fine, we 
um, take care of her in any way. So these are, this is very important in our daily life. Of course, when I'm saying our daily life, it's like a life which have many people involved because we are the sister, we are the social worker, we are the education with the psychological people. I mean, it's, it's, even there is a network. I mean, there are many people involved. But it's important as uh, care, as a, our pedagogy says, care is a fundamental dimension of the structure of being. Caring for the women is more similar to sustaining, providing a point of support for them to gain momentum in managing their own lives. So this is a, this takes time, but it's important because it's a, it's a, a role play. I mean, we have to work together. We have to risk going to her house, house as a person, to other lands, to a different reality, because it's also uh, for us is any women that comes is something new. And we learn together to how to work together because she will tr bring us a story, but we will give her also our story. So together we build the story of the time that we are sharing in the shelter. And it's a very good, I mean, it's not easy at all, but it's very um, interesting and it's very nice to see how day by day, their uh, their face is bright. I mean, and because uh, you know, it's not easy if uh, even the age is very important because it's not the same if you are eighteen or underage or thirty, because the conception of reality and life is is different. It's not the same if they have uh, children at home, because they need to work because they have to maintain family. So this makes also the difference in the daily life. That's why for us, any approach to the women is individual because we, we build together the, um, the process according to our needs. No, because there, I mean, we can have something written, but we have to work it daily. And then in time, it has to change because we don't, it is not always, everything is not written because we know that life is changing and us, we are not the same today that yesterday and we won't be the same tomorrow. So this is important that we take, we consider all this. Um, for me, it's very important that uh, we talk about liberation, which is a principle that aims at strengthening the autonomy and the self-fulfillment of the woman. Because if in the years she didn't have the chance or the opportunity to take the decision for herself, now she's she passed from being the victim to the, the, I mean, the first person deciding. We just help her. We just uh, give her um, information. We accompany her, but we don't decide for her. Because, of course, uh, most of them, I would say the totality, are not from Spain. And we all know which is, which, which is live in a different country, which is not yours because we all know the problem of the papers, we all know about the language, because it's not the same that if they are Spain, I mean, they, if they come from South America, they speak Spanish, at least they have the language. But if they are not speaking Spanish, we need time to learn the language. And we know we, this is not easy. And this takes time because it is to a daily basis work together with them, give her strength, say not give up, you will succeed and we will succeed together. So to be honest, is um, this way to freedom is very, very nice to share together because to incarnate ourselves in the reality of the other from equality and respect, a transfer of common path in a unique land. So this sentence for me makes a lot of sense because we are people from different countries, maybe in the shelter we are six people or seven people and each one of us is from a different country so it's like a little you and there which is very nice because we can learn from one another and learning from one another make us walk to our common goal so as i said the women is at center of our work as the idea of process in a process implies a special attention and flexibility to air experience and time of each woman because the pedagogy must be put at the service of people. I mean, in the shelter, uh, as I said before, 
if they know they know Spanish, make the difference in their process. But also make the difference in their process if they receive paper soon or later. It makes difference if uh, they can um, um, full or they can uh, attend some training course because this makes the difference. So even there are how many people in the, the shelter that we have, each one of them has a individual process. This is important because in our work, we have to be, uh, we have to take, be, to take care of this because sometimes uh, we should take care of the, the process of the women and say, okay, she can, now she's living this. Maybe tomorrow she will improve and she can do this. But today is this. Because we cannot force the time. Because if we force the time, we won't, go, we won't succeed. So this is very, very important for me. I will share you a little, another slide where it's a pedagogy of encounter. So it's a space of we. So it's encounter, it's a reciprocity, as I said before. So these are some words that for me are very important to create a zone of closeness, not only mental, but emotional. Be free to accept even when it does not occur. I mean, we don't, ex we won't expect they will say thanks. We won't expect they will accept whatever we say because they are individual. They are free to choose as if they want to leave. They are free to leave. We can just, then we can tell them. Okay, it's better to do this, it's better to do that, but she's free. Because if we, we work with her, the freedom or the liberation or to that she is um, an improved, I mean, empowerment to take decision, even the decision to leave is a decision. Of course, maybe it's not the best solution, but sometimes it doesn't occur that our closeness are in the same path. So commitment, trust, no judgment, proximity, reciprocity. I think these are some key words that we should keep in mind in, in our working work with them. And of course, it's not the same if the women who host in the shelter, uh, the um, country of origin make the difference because the culture makes the difference. And the um, mental concept of uh, the migration is also different because it's not the same Though if you come by a plane or if you come by a boat. As someone said, the journey makes the difference, which is exact, which is true. So we have to work on this because she needs to recover from the journey. The according as the journey was, takes more or less time. Also, this is important. So daily we are with them, we work with them, we talk with them, try to uh, to break the wall of um, this confidence, but to try to work that the trust is the main issue in our lives. And if the wall, the the wall, the yeah, the, I mean, the wall of trust is broken, things will change because we she knows that she can trust in us, and this is very very important. I will just, I think the time is over, but um, I mean, I really like this sentence, so I can leave it here. If, because for me, it gives lots of sense of what we we say. And I would like to, um, to say that many times the humiliations, the condition of exploitation and lack of control over one's life leave deep traces in their identity. So this is something that we should heal. Because if the wounds are not healed, then it's very difficult to recover, to work. And this is the daily life, which is, ma which is made of celebration, which is made of uh, taking tea together, uh, going out together. It's also, it's not only work, but it's also time of relax. And even the, and um, I would say informal moment sometimes are the best where you can really be you and share what you are living and how you feel. I think my time is gone. Okay, thank you, uh, Sister Maria Luisa. That was very impressive. And you gave a lot of information. 
so, so what I uh, what me, touched me very much is that you said we are living with the woman, you know. So you are not coming like something. Okay, we have to teach them, and it's, it's from above to down. But it's it's being together. It's sharing life, sharing the stories and take them on the same uh, level, you know, being equals, being a, like a, a partnership in life. And you had uh, many um, uh, words and terms that are filled with spirituality and the spirituality of your congregation that was founded uh, to help especially uh, uh, women who, who are now victims of trafficking. Uh, for sexual exploitation, I think. So you had trust, you had freedom, and you pointed very well uh, the the process. You know the process of healing. It's not something uh, st stable. So there is a process depending on the individuality, on the individual story of every woman, and you are dealing this in with living with them. Um, as you said, having a cup of tea having celebrations, having time together. And so that was a very beautiful presentation. And also thank you especially for the spirituality you showed to us, because that is also what we want to understand, how religious people um, come to the motivation to help, help uh, the, these survivors of uh, trafficking. And um, that helping doesn't mean from above, uh, to down, but on an equal level. So thank you very much for this uh, explanation how you as a religions are involved in this work to rescue and to heal uh, the wounds of uh, women uh, who have been victims of us, are survivors of trafficking. Thank you very much. So the uh, second um, expert we want to hear is uh, Sister Patricia Ebegulem. She, uh, at the moment, she said uh, her connection got um, bad again, and we will, after I present her a little bit to the audience, we will hear um, an audio, what she recorded, and see a pre uh, presentation. She will be back uh, to, um, to our question and answer round uh, via another technic uh, um, approach. So Sister Patricia Ebegulem is the sister of St. Louis, from Nigeria in West Africa. She became involved in anti-human trafficking and women issues in 1996, when she was the national president of the Nigeria Conference of Women Religious from 1996 to 2002. In this capacity, she with her executive founded the Committee for the Support of the Dignity of Women, a network which is in the forefront of combating human trafficking. Sister Patricia later became the African coordinator of the African Network Against Human Trafficking. She was also the African coordinator of Talita Kum, International Network of Consecrated Life Against Trafficking in Persons from 2009 to 2019. At the end of her tino with Talita Kum, she was given an award in recognition of her being one of the pioneers of the anti-trafficking movement in Nigeria and for contributing significantly to combating human trafficking in Nigeria and sub-Saharan Africa. Sister Patricia is the author of the book Stop Trafficking in Women and Children, It's a Crime Against Humanity, a handbook for schools. She is currently the coordinator of Bakita, St. Louis Empowerment Network. So now we will uh, listen to the presentation of uh, Sister Patricia. All protocol duly observed. The title of the presentation is Working with Returned Victims of Human Trafficking in Bakita Safe House. I feel honored to be invited to share our experience of working with returned victims of human trafficking in Bakita Safe House. Bakita Project is a St. Louis Empowerment Network named after the Sudanese saint, St. Josephine Bakita. It belongs to the Sisters of St. Louis 
and was built for the re rehabilitation of the victims of human trafficking. Bakita project as we have it today started in 2015 with the assistance of Slaves No More in Italy as our principal partner. In 2019, we went into partnership with the Sovereign Order of Malta, who helped with the completion of Bakita Safe House, ensuring that it meets international standards. Our Bakita Safe House has the capacity to accommodate 30 ladies comfortably. There is an additional bungalow for our mothers, for four mothers with their babies. In working with the returned victims of human trafficking, we employ a holistic approach spanning from the time they choose to return for those who return voluntarily and for those who are deported, our encounter with them begins from our reception of them at the airport. In this presentation, I will focus on a simple step-by-step -step practice of how our victims are received and protected in our safe house and eventually reintegrated into the society with a stable means of livelihood to ensure that they live in dignity. The key word here is dignity. Guided by our Bakita ethics and values, an in-house social policy document, we operate a radial relationship model. This relationship includes from destination country to victims, their families, and to the larger society. Our aim is to make sure those victims that return to us have a brighter future in our country, Nigeria, and be like every other citizen. This is because from reception to reintegration, we go extra mile in their reorientation, rehabilitation, and reintegration. The task does not finish there. After reintegration, we go a long way to monitor them and evaluate their business because they are our treasures. I wish to state here that most of us who run safe houses in Nigeria have unanimously agreed that we refer to these victims of human trafficking as treasures. We want them to know that they are valued and treasured both in God's sight and in our own sight. So in this paper, I will refer to them occasionally as treasures. During the period of rehabilitation, we engage the treasures in counseling, spiritual direction, and taking care of all their needs. These victims come to us damaged, bruised, dejected, rejected, battered, and shattered. The traumatic nature of their experience requires great care, and this is what we give through counseling, spiritual direction, and maternal affection in Bakita Safe House. Our goal is to reduce the influence of their past negative experiences and ensure the overall well-being of the victim. During the early period of their stay in the safe house, we put them through the Mindset Reset Program, which is usually organized for them to reorient their minds and bring them to the reality of life, showing them that there is more to life than what they have been exposed to. We teach them values. This soul healing program is very vital to our project. In the course of counseling, we discovered great talents among them. Some are great singers and some are fantastic dancers. At Bakita, we operate the radial relationship model from the destination country, including the victims, their families, and the larger society. Staff training. We conduct trainings for our staff made up of the sisters, employed lay staff, and voluntary workers. In Bakita, we call ourselves family, and as such, every victim is welcomed and received as a family member. Our reception is in three phases. First, pre-reception phase. 
Sometimes the reception of some treasures begins from their country of destination. As soon as they nurse the idea and desire to return home to Nigeria, the country of their birth, those joining with them in their countries of destination put them in touch with us in Nigeria so that we can talk with them, establish a relationship, and give them the opportunity to ask questions. Second, informal reception. For others, the reception begins at the airport when we go to meet them, welcome them, and bring them to our Bakita Villa. On arrival in our safe house, the victim is given a surprise welcome home party known as a no place like home party. Here we prepare ethnic specialties as a result of earlier conversation and their request for what food they miss most while away. After the meal, the treasures in the safe house welcome them with songs and dances. We make them feel at home by introducing ourselves to them and they in turn introduce themselves to us. After it all, they are taken to their rooms. The next is the formal reception. The formal reception is in two phases. The first phase is where the personal data of the victim is documented. We ensure that proper identification is done. It involves filling our reception and identification forms. We take them to the hospital for medical screening for HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases to ascertain their medical status and know what appropriate measures to take. The second phase of the formal reception is continued the following day or two after the arrival. They are taken to the National Agency Prohibiting the Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIB Office, for documentation and other preliminaries. Protection. At Bakita, protection is given to the victims from legislative and informal ways. Bakita Ethics and values provides ways of protection for the rights of the victim and means of reintegrating them as citizens. This comes in varying spheres of social assistance. One, legal. We provide legal aids to avoid embarrassment from immigration commission. This is why before their arrival, a formal arrangement is done so that when they are received at the airport, They are not embarrassed on arrival. Sometimes the immigration arrangements are made with NAPTIB. Shelter and security. Our treasures stay in a safe house where their basic needs are met. Food, steady supply of electricity, water, and clothing. Those of them that return voluntarily through slaves no more in Italy or Solwood in Germany have better chances of settling down because they had been in shelters run by sisters and have had the opportunities of receiving pastoral care. Furthermore, these organizations send them with budgets for their rehabilitation and reintegration. Societal and family stigmatization One of the problems these treasures face on arrival is stigmatization. We at Bakita try as much as possible to stop this stigmatization. We keep them in our safe house, connect with their homes, counsel their parents and families as we try to reconcile and reunite them with their families. Psychological and spiritual support. Because of the nature of trafficking in Nigeria, where the victims are taken to shrines to take oaths of secrecy before their initial departure from Nigeria, these treasures need psychological and spiritual support to free them from the strong bond reinforced by a voodoo or juju ritual. We try to reassure them that the God in them is greater than all the juju in the world put together and that as children of God, they have nothing to fear. We counsel and pray with them in an ongoing basis. Rescue from death. Most of the victims are made to believe that they are in huge debt to their madams and the trafficking network. 
we try to protect them by investigating their stories to ensure that the connection with their traffickers is dismantled. Most time, with the help of NAPTI, most of the traffickers are on the run. We get the treasures to know their rights, and using our connections and our lawyers, we try to access justice for them where and when necessary. Career and economic security. This is done by either assisting the treasurer to learn a trade, go back to school, open a business venture or acquire skills. Right now in our safe house, eight of our treasures go out to learn such skills as hairdressing and makeup, tailoring, catering, decoration and event planning. One is processing her admission to the university. After skill acquisition, these treasures are empowered and equipped with materials to enable them run and operate their own businesses to support themselves and their families. This is one of the ways we tackle poverty, which is a major ingredient in human trafficking in the developing countries. By establishing them in a trade, we reduce their vulnerability and the danger of being re-trafficked. Reintegration, this further ensures their protection and consolidates the process of recovery. After the reintegration follows the process of monitoring and evaluation. This is key in ensuring that all they have been given are put into good use. After we have set them up with some form of business, we go periodically to monitor them to ensure how their project is growing and assist them to overcome difficulties and challenges. End of year party. At the end of every calendar year, we have Christmas party for all our treasures past and present. All look forward to it. It has a great bonding effect because those who have left for over five years still insist on coming back to celebrate. We celebrate with them to give them that sense of belonging and also put them in the festive mood of Christmas. Before I end this presentation, permit me to share some of our moments of light and moments of darkness. Our moments of darkness are the same as our challenges, moments of light. We are happy to share that we have recorded many success stories. In recent times, eight of our treasures have been reintegrated into the society with their families. They are doing well in their various businesses and work placements. A good number of our treasures got married after reintegration and they are living happily with their families, having been blessed with children. Immediately after the first phase of the lockdown, one of our treasures got established in her business and residence on July 4, 2020. Some younger ones are in higher institutions of learning, universities and polytechnics, while some others are studying to write WAEK, NECO, JAMB, and processing admission into higher institutions of learning. Some of them acquired skills in such areas as hairdressing, tailoring, catering and selling of provisions and foodstuff. Thanks to the Sisters of St. Louis, Slaves No More, Order of Malta, Soul Woody, and their supporters, these groups have brought hope and happiness in the lives of our treasures and their families. Challenges. First, need for skill acquisition in our safe house to make security less risky to reduce cost of transportation in the absence of a vehicle to transport them to and fro the institute where they learn their skills, and to reduce the high fee we pay for each of these treasures. Another big challenge is vehicle to transport the treasures to workshops, rallies, and awareness creation against human trafficking, and even to their skill acquisition center, as earlier stated. In conclusion, I thank the organizers of this webinar for giving us the opportunity of sharing our life and experience in Bakita Safe House. I'm particularly grateful to Mr. Michelle Vithi for reaching out to us to participate in this webinar. 
We pray that through our concerted efforts, this evil of human trafficking will be raised from the face of the earth. Renewed thanks. God bless. Thanks again for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, report and recording. So hearing all these uh, comprehensive report of the uh, welcoming and um, um, reintegration of survivors of trafficking, so I, I want to emphasize the word treasures. You know, that is such a deep and wonderful spirituality to call uh, these persons uh, treasures and um, show them how valued and treasured they are by God in reality. So this is something I really, um, uh, I'm uh, very impressed by this. And um, also we saw the multi uh, facets, the multi uh, work uh, that you need to do for this reintegration, like you have the spiritual uh, accompaniment, counseling, uh, you uh, meet them with ma uh, maternal affection, economic uh, topics, psychological topics, emotional and spiritual. So there are so many uh, different things to be seen uh, in this work. Uh, thank you for explaining us how complex uh, this work uh, has to be if it uh, will be uh, finally successful and uh, helps the people and the survivors of trafficking to reintegrate in the, and take their life in freedom back. Uh, now our uh, next speaker is uh, Father Mark Ehichoya Odion. Um, he is a Catholic priest of the Missionary Society of St. Paul of Nigeria. He works at the Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales in the International Affairs Department as an Africa Project Coordinator for the Santa Marta Group. Features of his work currently are coordinating the partnership between uh, the um, Bishops' Conference of Wales um, and the Catholic Bishops in Edo State, Nigeria, aimed at combating human trafficking in and from the state. He also engaged in parish, parish awareness campaigns in England and Wales, making communities aware of the presence of trafficking and modern, modern slavery, particularly domestic servitude and abuse in those localities. He facilitates the awareness campaign of the plight of seasonal agricultural workers in the UK. He also helps the local church, dioceses and parishes to identify and reach out to victims by organizing seminars and training at the parish level, which focus on the potential victims and how the local church can supportively respond to their needs. He has further been able, with the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales, Support to support to reach out to those experiencing domestic abuse or those who have been trafficked and remain in the control of traffickers, enabling them to talk to the police about their experiences and obtain help to regain their freedom and confidence. He um, presently coordinates the Santa Marta Group program and network within Africa. He is currently a trustee of. Catholic Agency for Overseas Development and the Grow Edo Charity. He is a PhD researcher in organized crime and the role of traditional culture and religious belief in facilitating the activities of human trafficking. Uh, Father Mark, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, sister, and uh, thank you for inviting me to take part in this presentation. I want to begin this presentation by making reference to the recent uh, encyclical of the Holy Father, where he basically reminded us that uh, trafficking is a worldwide problem and that it needs a serious effort from every one of us in order to combat the issue of trafficking. And his major reason is basically based on the fact that these traffickers, they, are, they work in a very strong network. And as a result of that, we have to make our own effort in trying to combat the issue of trafficking. 
And of course, the Santa Marta group is uh, tirelessly doing a little best to see how to help people who are enslaved in this modern crime. And who are, what is the Santa Marta group? The Santa Marta group basically is an alliance between the international police chiefs and the bishops. And the, the Holy Father brought this group together with the aim of trying to see how they can eradicate the issue of trafficking. Far back in 2014, when we met in Rome, the police chiefs and the bishops came together and they signed that commitment to see how they can work together with the hope of eradicating the issue of trafficking. The group is called Santa Marta because the first meeting basically took place at the Pope's residence in Rome. And after, uh, during the meeting, the Holy Father came and named the group after his residence. And since then, we've been meeting and trying to see how we can help people who are basically entrapped in this um, crime of human trafficking. And what are our strategies? Basically, we aim at raising awareness of the scales of the global crime of human trafficking and modern slavery. And at the same time, we try to develop trusting relationship among law enforcement agencies, the church, and even civil society. And at the same time, we focus on our work in, the, in looking at the victims, not to criminalize them, but to find ways of trying to help them. We are victim-centered, as it were. And of course, we share our experiences through our networks with the hope that others will be able to learn on how to uh, address the issue that we are faced with. And if we look at the facts of life, as I have it in this slide, and uh, if we are to talk of slavery, probably far back in 1850, say in America or thereabout, slaves probably would have cost maybe 30,000 pounds, which in today's currency, with 30,000 pounds, you can afford to buy at least a good car or a brand new car. But then here in UK, we've discovered that the price of a slave is basically a fare, either a bus fare or a train ticket, because people could be trafficked either from Europe or from Eastern Europe or thereabout, though they may have the access of coming in, they are still being trafficked or coming from Asia or Africa, where by the criminals basically sought for opportunity to actually get what are we call the visiting visa for some of these people. Nowadays, traffickers who are more advanced, they go through what I would call the legal means to get visas for their victims. And once they come in with visiting visa, they know that the visiting visa permits them to come in, but at the same time, they are limited. So they take their passport from them. And from that moment, they become their probably their material as it were. They don't see them as human beings. So in a way, what is needed now is not that 30,000 pounds, but it's just probably a ticket. It could be bus ticket. It could be airline ticket. So here in the UK, modern slavery is a reality. We cannot avoid that. And modern slavery happens within our communities within our communities and anyone can become a victim of modern slavery, either modern slavery or trafficking as it were. And trafficking happens very close to everybody within the UK. So we cannot avoid that. And the traffickers basically, they use manipulation, excessive manipulation to control their victims. And of course, 
if we are to probably as good people, religious people, people who probably uh, have regard for human dignity, if we are to fold our hands and just sit back and say, well, it doesn't concern us, as Edmund Burke puts it, all that is necessary for evil to continue to triumph is for good men and women like you and I to do nothing, just to sit down there and fold our hands. But we must do something. And that is what the Holy Father is challenging each and every one of us, that we must be out there doing something to help those trapped in these abuses. And of course, if we look at the whole issue of human trafficking, what is the aim of these traffickers? Basically, the activity of human trafficking and modern slavery is being facilitated by withdrawing the dignity of the human person. Just as you withdraw the passport from the individual, basically, in withdrawing that passport, you withdraw the dignity, the rights of this individual. And once that is with, withdrawn, the individual becomes is an object of abuse. And of course, there are different ways through which this can happen. And um, when we talk of the commodification of the human person, we are looking at the whole concept of domestic abuse. Domestic abuse, agricultural sectors, construction work, and of course, sexual abuse. All these go on underneath the whole activity of human traffic. And of course, recently we discovered that even organ harvesting still go on within the country. So I want to probably look at some of the areas where Santa Marta is um, working at the moment in the UK. First and foremost, uh, in the sector of the seasonal agricultural workers. The seasonal agricultural workers are those who are brought in seasonally into the country to engage in agricultural work. Sometimes they could come from Eastern Europe. And these traffickers enter into a contract with the individuals, different from the contract that the government actually has. They tell, you, they tell them from their countries of origin that, oh, you are going to the UK, you have, this is the contract, and you are forced to sign, or you are made to sign the contract, thinking that it is a valid contract. And they tie so much death on the individual. They bring them in, they live normal life like every other human being, and when you try to tell them, look, the contract given to you is different from the one that the government actually has. As far as they are concerned, this is the contract I signed, and I will work with this contract. And such contract is very, very oppressive, very, very abusive. And at the end of the day, they work in the farm, and they get little or no pay for it because the trafficker is getting all the money. And sometimes, too, the traffickers get accommodation for them where they are made to pay probably very high rate. And the, the building or the structure may even be for the traffickers themselves. So at the end of the day, we notice that these are the three major areas that uh, the seasonal agricultural workers are being exploited. So we try to engage in helping them to realize that, look, there is so much abuse going on in this sector. You need to come out of it. So in one of the things that we do as uh, Santa Marta group here in the UK, we organize seminars in the areas where we have these farms. And we try to bring in the parishes and people from that community, try to let them see that, look, this is evil. We need to fight it together. So we trained some of the parishioners there. And having trained them, probably maybe in a day or two, we commissioned them in a liturgical celebration, asking them to go out into their parishes, to go out into their community and speak against this. And at the end of it all, maybe after two or three months or thereabout, we all meet again and they bring their feedbacks. In the course of the training, we always have police officers there. And when they come back with their feedbacks, 
they always have police officers there. So the, the police officer collects all these feedbacks from them, and it's almost like we are giving them materials to work with. So they go back with those materials to see how they can trace some of these criminals. And of course, another thing we do is um, we try to write some um, article to the government or, or in the media here so that they can see some of the things going on recently. I, I, I think in the course of this uh, pandemic, an article is written. We have the link to that article on this presentation. Uh, if, if, the, if the slide is shared, feel free to have a look. Basically, what we aim at looking at the article is to see how we can help some of these seasonal agricultural workers. And at the end of it all, we are able to write to the government that, look, this is an article that is published, but the article itself does not probably do the work. But we write articles to the government, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, the Home Office that is in charge of visa, to see how you how, how the government can easily go back and address some of this issue. Because if the government is not involved in addressing this issue, it becomes almost like uh, an effort that is not being appreciated. So another area that we look at is the... Uh, engagement in parish awareness campaign. Parish awareness campaign is very, very crucial in our work, especially here in the UK, because we go around to talk to, uh, to create that awareness within parishes, to let parishioners know that the evil of trafficking is very close to them. Because sometimes if people are not aware of some of this, it becomes almost like, well, we are not sure. I remember going to a place, to a parish, and uh, at the end of the mass, a lady came and gave me a card and said, oh, please, can you call this number? And I looked at the card. It was a neighbor, a neighbor. Basically, she was drawing my attention to the fact that trafficking is going on in that neighbor. And I got the message. So I quickly passed on the details to the police we work with. And I believe they followed it up from there and they got to the criminals. So we can see that sometimes if we don't create this awareness within parishes, the parishes are our immediate tools as religious, as Catholics, and as Christians. It is only when we create this awareness within our parishes that people will be aware of the evil that goes on. And we train, like here in the UK, we have different chaplaincies. The uh, of different countries. So we train them to be vigilant of those who come to their chaplaincies. Because sometimes people are brought in and some of sometimes we tend to think that uh, the traffickers are very far away from us. Some traffickers go to mass. Some traffickers, they participate in our services. As you go to church to go and pray that God should bless your family, bless your endeavor. Some of these traffickers, they see it as business. They go to mass to go and pray that God should bless their business. And it is only when we are aware of this, that uh, the chaplains are aware of this, then they can begin to conscientize their people to fish out some of those who are not really in unison with them. So in a way, we encourage our chaplains here, we train them, and we have periodic uh, meetings with them to find out what is going on in your chaplaincy. And of course, we organize seminars um, occasionally uh, in different areas, train priests in their various dinaries, and we follow it up with a series of uh, meetings and sessions to find out what exactly is going on. And of course, we collaborate with the law enforcement here, with National Crime Agency and with the police, because we need them in order to do our work. And they need us in order to do their work. So we work hand in hand. And that is the goal of the Santa Marta. And of course, uh, we carry out some measures in looking after our victims here. Yeah. As uh, Sister Patricia said, she called them uh, the treasures. The treasures. We call them the guests. <laughs> Different people have different names for them. But the most important thing is that uh, we try to remove that 
stigmatization of seeing themselves as victims. Rather, they should see themselves as people who are valued, people who, whose dignity should be respected, not devalued. So we try to give them that confidence that they are also created in the image and likeness of God. So here in the UK, we have uh, our Bakita House, which is run uh, by Westminster Diocese, and the aim is to basically integrate some of these people who are vulnerable. I remember going to a parish, and uh, after speaking, a wo two women actually came out, and one of them told me the horrible story of my life, that she had been sleeping in the beans. During the winter, she looked for the nearest bean to go in and sleep. You could imagine the horrible story this woman told me that day. I couldn't just but call the police immediately. And that night, we had to take her to Bakita House because she cannot just keep on living in the bin. She was lucky. Supposing those who come to empty the bin decide just to carry the bin and put in the vehicle, she's gone. She's gone. They will just, the, the, the machine or the vehicle will crush her. But thanks be to God, at least, before it got to that stage, she was able to speak out. And today, uh, through the help of the uh, police and Santa Marta, she is living happily in the country. And the government looked into her issue and saw that her, her case was genuine. I think she was given visa, a compassionate uh, visa to remain in the country. The Home Office too cooperates on that regard to see how to help those who have genuine cases to remain in the country. And here too, we have a, a program that has to do with family unification. And basically, you get migrants who come in and the government came up with a policy of unifying families. And the church was at the forefront of helping the government to achieve that goal. And parishes are, are told to create centers. There are parishes within the country that created centers where they can take in families in order to unify them with their, with, uh, in, in the country, get them schools for those who, are, uh, who have children and get them houses. So in a way, we try to help some of these families to ensure that they have a better means of livelihood and that they see themselves as human person, not just people who are going through abuses in that sense. Because if you don't help them, they will fall into the hands of the trafficker and they will be abused. And also we try to engage in empowerment. Because one of the things we noticed that the bottom line of the whole concept of trafficking rests in corruption. In the probably country of origin, for example, a lot of people want to leave simply because there is no good job. The government is corrupt or whatever. So what we try to do is to see how we can help to uh, create some means of empowerment. So one of the basic things that we did, like in uh, Edo State, where trafficking seemed to be very, very high, we try to encourage the people there to look inward. The whole idea of looking inward. Sister Patricia was talking and is, she mentioned the whole idea of maybe getting some funds from the Order of Malta, I think, which I think was a very good uh, in, innovation. And I think in our own case, we may not have that funding, but one of the things we do is to encourage people to look inward to look inward, what do you have? What do you have that you can develop? And one of the things that the Grow Edo project basically did in Edo State was to encourage youth to go back to agriculture. To agriculture. Many of them have got their potries. Many of them have got their farms. They are not beginning to produce food in order to help to develop the, their own area. And many of them, through agriculture, they're able to at least employ some others to work with them. So uh, enabling them to look inward has actually helped to empower a lot of young people in the, in the States. So some of the 
recommendation I will want to propose at this event is first and foremost, dioceses and parishes should create a commission or structure with the responsibility of tackling the phenomena of human trafficking. There has to be a structure because sometimes if we just leave that in the blue like that, nothing will be done because all of us, we say, oh, how evil it is for people to be trafficked. But if there is no structure to fight this um, evil activity, then it will keep on triumphing. So we need a structure. So we encourage dioceses and parishes to think of how they can come up with a structure. And of course, if we are looking for maybe an organization to uh, work with, there is need for a proper identification. Proper identific identification. Like the Knights of Mota, for example, you are able to identify the Bakita house run by Sister uh, Patricia because you trust that it is a structure you can partner with. Sometimes if you don't get, if you don't take your time to identify the proper organization to partner with, you will become a victim yourself because you will be used. So it's always good to identify a proper structure to network with, with the aim of fighting this evil. And of course, the aim of all this is prevention at all level. Prevention at all level. So we should be aiming at encouraging awareness, raising at all level. There has to be that constant awareness raising. And also uh, partnership with local law enforcement agencies. Wherever we are, we should be ready to partner with local law enforcement agencies. Empowerment, as I said earlier on, is something that is needed. And if we're able to empower the youth at the grassroots, it will go a long way of preventing trafficking. If we're able to empower them at the grassroots, and or the empowerment may not necessarily be incentive, uh, maybe creating job opportunity for them. It could be even helping them to go to school. To go to school. Education is very, very important. So in conclusion, the overriding aim of Santa Marta is to create partnership within and between church, local law enforcement, and civil society, locally and internationally, with the aim of eradicating human trafficking and modern slavery. This is, in, this is new and unique because the aim, every organization have got their own objective. What with Santa Marta is just to focus on trafficking. How do we help to battle this evil in our society? And of course, everything should be towards stopping trafficking. And our goal is more or less victim-centered. And if we are victim-centered, we aim at pursuing the traffickers. Now, I would want to end my presentation by making reference to this last slide that says, if we, I think we, all of us know about William Wilberforce in his efforts in, to combating human trafficking. He made this wonderful statement. Having heard all of this, you may choose to look other ways, but you can never say again that you did not know. I think that statement is very, very wonderful. We should always have that at the back of our heart. We can never claim we don't know. Trafficking exists. And as Edmund Borg says, all that is needed is for good people to pretend that nothing happens to them. But then you and I, we must be ready to arise, to stand and do something. So what are we ready to do? Thank you.
Thank you so much, Father Mark, for your very vibrant and uh, uh, presentation. But what, uh, first, I want to say is thank you for the recommendations. Uh, we will surely use them because we will have a follow-up of this webinar. There will be other webinars, and we want to take action. And this is a, it's a wonderful presentation also to show maybe to, to parishes wherever we can go because it explains very good uh, what it is about and what has to be done. What I heard mostly of your presentation is the first thing that human trafficking is a reality. It's there. And we cannot close our eyes. We know it now. Then that the victims of trafficking are becoming an object. They are dehumanized. They lose their dignity when they are taken the, the passport away. Uh, so that is something that I uh, take out of your um, wonderful presentation. We don't have so much time and we don't want to uh, be over time. But there was one question from the audience um, to Sister Maria Luisa. Uh, what about the capacity of shelters in your city? Can you accept all women? So I give the floor to you, sister. Uh, here in Valencia, we have seven places. And well, I don't know what they mean when you accept all women, <laughs> because if we talk about uh, um, often welcome everyone, it, uh, but sometimes it depends of the project that we have. I mean, because we we have a project of, from victim of uh, human trafficking, but if they are if the project is only for uh, sexual exploitation, they have to be sexually exploited. Or we can have a project of for uh, victim of human trafficking, and then we can even host women from uh, labor uh, exploitation, for instance, or forced marriage. So it depends on the project, but in general, we we can accept all women if we mean uh, all women victim of the trafficking. Uh, we can, it depends if the project can host a mother with some children or not because of even the house, because there are some law um, uh, situation that we have to respect. And I mean, it depends what they mean as all women, but in general, uh, if they fit or the target women of the project, of course, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Maria Luisa. Now, there are no questions uh, more, and I wouldn't ask now because we really want to keep uh, the time. We know some of you have other um, commitments. So thank you all uh, for joining us. We will follow up this webinar, hoping to stay in contact with you after this webinar. We will inform you how we can continue to work together and build a coalition to end human trafficking. Also, uh, questions will be welcome. Also, after this webinar, you can contact us and give us your question. So we will stay uh, in contact and see how we can answer uh, all your needs. Um, and now, uh, to be in time, uh, I would give the floor to uh, Michelle to close the session. Well, thank you very much. Indeed, I would like to thank all organizers, all speakers, so powerful and all participants to be with us tonight. Uh, we shall meet again next Tuesday at the same time, six o'clock, uh, on how every one of us could play a role in promoting awareness and action to prevent and combat human trafficking. We shall again share concrete examples of how communities could advocate on behalf of victims of human trafficking. In the meantime, I do encourage you to visit the ChristusLiberat.org website with a treasure chest of best practices and access to a free online course on human trafficking for helpers and the opportunity to register, of course, to all future webinars. So thank you very much and hope to see you next week again. All the best. Goodbye. Bye.